So um, why is quantum gravity so hard? And that's, I, I wanted to have a lecture just about why it's such a problem before we talk about this. Is, what's the point of string theory? The point of the big selling point of string theory, at least well, one of the selling points, is uh, that it gives us a consistent description of quantum gravity. But to understand why we have to go to something as weird as string theory with extra dimensions and all that, I think it's important to get an idea of why the problem of quantizing gravity is hard. What is it that distinguishes gravity from everything else? The standard model works great. We can describe every other force of nature quite well. Gravity, and the heart of it, seems to be much simpler, right? You know, the idea that massive bodies attract is much easier for us to visualize than the idea that, you know, there's these weird nuclear forces at short distance scales. So if we can make sense of these nuclear forces, why is this simple thing like gravity so hard to deal with? And, well, I wanted to give the punchline up front so you can, you can sort of have the idea of what you know, have the point I'm trying to get across in the back of your mind throughout the entire lecture. And the punchline is essentially this. There is no clean separation between physics at large distances, which is what we directly measure in experiments, and physics at short distances, which we only indirectly measure when you describe quantum gravity. Quantum gravity is very sensitive to short distance physics, and quantum effects become important at very large distance scales. So, the basic idea, and just an idea to keep in the back of your mind throughout the lecture, is that uh, when you're studying quantum processes, uh, you have to include, you know, as soon as you start talking about quantum processes, you have to, you're implicitly talking about physics at all energy scales. Because you have to do this sum over histories. You have, to, you have to imagine every way that a process could possibly happen. And it can happen with some intermediate high energy stuff. So you have to imagine, so, in principle, when you talk about quantum corrections, as soon as you go to the quantum realm, you're talking about physics and contributions from physics at very short distance scales or very high energy scales. We lucked out with the standard model. The standard model we lucked out because we didn't need to know all of that detail so much. We just needed to know a little bit about what's going on in short distance physics. Quantum gravity is the exact opposite. We either know all the quantum, you know, we either know all the short distance physics or we don't. We can't build up in energy scale like we did with the standard model. So that'll hopefully become more clear as the lecture goes on. And well, the plan for today is to talk about really two different puzzles regarding relating to quantum gravity. Um, the first, and I wanted to mention this because these two halves of the lecture are very distinct. They're not really dependent on each other. So there'll be a, there'll be a sharp transition between the two. The first, I just want to talk about everything that goes wrong when we try to quantize gravity by, an an by analogy to what we did with the other forces by just talking about gravitons and graviton exchange. And then in the second half, I want to talk about this black hole information paradox, because that's another example of how long distance scales and short distance scales are not cleanly separated in gravity like they are in the other fundamental forces of nature. So there'll be a clear dividing line between the two. So but first, I want to talk about graviton exchange. And in order to do that, I'm going to throw up some slides from last time in order to set the, set the tone. So we remember that gravity from last time describes the curvature of space time by energy momentum. We have some source of energy, or some source of, source of mass here at the curves of space time. Maybe some particles moving along, that particle's going to feel the curvature and follow a curve trajectory. Now, how does this mass know that the particle is here? How does this mass feel the effects of this particle? Well, not through action at a distance, as we saw. We saw that this particle emits ripples. As it moves through space time, it causes ripples. And this guy has no idea that this guy is there until the ripples get there. So these ripples are gravity waves. Here's an image of very strong gravity waves being produced by a binary system. And these gravity waves are an exact analog of electromagnetic waves. So naturally, if you want to quantize gravity, you think, OK, we know how to quantize electromagnetism. Gravity is not so different. OK, there are positive and negative charges. But gravity is not so different. We have these waves that are essentially force carriers. So can we proceed and describe quantum gravity the same way we put electromagnetism? So let me remind you what we do with electromagnetism. With electromagnetism, we have this idea of the electromagnetic wave as a force carrier. Some part electron is sitting here. At some point, this electron is going to feel a force if we bring another one in. But when does this, how does this electron know that the, uh, the electron on the left is present and, and moving by? Well, it knows because as this electron moves by, it changes the electromagnetic field in its vicinity. And it does so by sort of creating ripples in the electromagnetic field. Those ripples are electromagnetic waves. They propagate. And this guy feels the presence of this guy as soon as those waves get here. So the information about the electromagnetic field changing is carried in these ripples. And this electron feels the force when these ripples get there. And the nice part of this is that it replaces action at a distance with, with uh, 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 action that takes this information being carried at a finite speed so that information doesn't travel faster than light, which we saw in the first lecture again. 
So that was that's a macroscopic version of the following quantum process. Remember that an electromagnetic wave is created of many smallest pieces. There's the smallest piece of the electromagnetic wave, the smallest quantum of energy, which is the photon. And so the way that electrons really interact at the microscopic level is by passing photons back and forth between each other. So we build up this theory of quantum electrodynamics, and I put these guys now in many, many slides, but it's a very important theory. We build this theory of quantum electrodynamics by starting with the fundamental interaction of an electron with a photon, where an electron can scatter moving along this absorbed photon and with some interaction of strength. And then we proceed from there. And if we want to do calculations, we saw a while ago that if we're interested in really what happens, what hap how does an electron behave if you shoot it with a photon? If a photon comes in, the electron absorbs it. Um, how does this process happen? Well, I have to sum over histories. You know, we saw early on that as you zoom in to what's going on in this blue box, we don't know if this has happened or something more complicated happens. We don't maybe this will happen. So maybe the electron just goes along and absorbs, uh, absorbs the photon that we shot in. Maybe the electron first emits a photon and then reabsorbs it. Maybe the electron emits a photon, and that photon makes an electron positron pair, and then they annihilate to a photon, and it gets reabsorbed. Any one of these complicated things could be happening inside the blue bubble, and we have to sum up over all of the possibilities. We have to sum over the histories. That's really what the Feynman diagram expansion is all about. Now, each one of these pictures is really just a picture corresponding to an equation. And as I think I've probably said before, the equations were derived first. You know, people try to calculate what happens if you take a photon and an electron and shoot them together and, and get an electron out. They try to calculate what happens, you know, what, what energies the electron has, what angle it comes out at. Um, and, and the calculation naturally involves a whole bunch of contributions, many different terms, and Feynman realized there was a nice picture you could draw for each term, and that's where the expansion comes from. Um, there's two things I want to say about this expansion. Um, well, the, the one thing is that uh, it's an expansion in, 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 in the parameter E, where E is the charge of the electron. So every time that you have this fundamental interaction of an electron absorbing a photon, you get a factor of the electron charge. So you get three factors here, you get three factors here. And in general, th this sum over all histories will take the form of something proportional to E, something proportional to E cubed, something proportional to E to the fifth, and so on and so forth. And you might worry that this doesn't make sense. If E was a number like 10, then this would be 1,000, and this would be you know, 100,000, and so on and so forth. And it looks like we're adding terms that get bigger and bigger, and it makes no sense. Fortunately, this E, I shouldn't have written E here. I should have written the fine structure constant. This E is basically that 1 over 137 you've probably heard about. So 1 over 137 is pretty small. 1 over 137 cubed is even smaller. To the fifth is even smaller. So this expansion makes sense. But the problem that we run into when we try to quantize electromagnetism is that every one of these coefficients, which is, the, which is what happens when we evaluate the equation that corresponds to this picture, is infinite. So we get a nice expansion. We get, we, we get a, a term like E that's just what happens when an electron meets a photon. We get another term that represents what happens when all this crazy stuff goes on with electron, you know, emitting, emitting photons and reabsorbing all this stuff. And actually, this should be this. Thing. And, and we get more crazy stuff. But the actual equations here give us infinities. And we met these infinities before in our discussion of the standard model in lecture five. And I sort of said what I wanted to say about them then, but I want to re-emphasize it again here, in case you weren't here, and also because it really is uh, at the heart of life, you know, what's going to go wrong with gravity. So, so we do a calculation. We ask ourselves, we shoot, we bring a, shoot a photon and an electron. What happens to the electron? We do the calculation, and we get an answer that's infinite. And that makes no sense. But as we said before, quantum field theory is smarter than we are. If, if it gives us an infinite answer, we've done something wrong. We've made an assumption that's wrong. And the assumption here we made that's wrong is the following. When we sum over histories, we include all possible things that can go on in here, which means we allow the internal particles here to carry arbitrarily high energy. You can always, in quantum mechanics, borrow as much energy as you want from the vacuum, as long as you get it back very quickly. So these particles have arbitrarily high energy. So when we evaluate the probability of this process happening, we're implicitly assuming that we know how these very high energy particles behave. And the truth is, we don't really. And in fact, you know that I'm not doing it correctly because I haven't said anything about black holes. And if these particles become energetic enough, they make black holes. So you already know that something's missing from the picture. So we don't really know what's going on at high energy. And the infinite answer, if you go look at it, the infinite answer is coming from 
the part of the sum over history is where these particles are at high energy. So the fact that we do this calculation and we get an infinity is because we do not really know what the physics is at high energy. We're making a mistake about what the high energy physics or the short distance physics is. And, and that mistake is killing us. So faced with this problem, what can we possibly do? Well, the only recourse that we have is to parameterize our ignorance. We don't know what the short distance physics is, so we try to introduce parameters to describe it. And you know that's that's what physicists do. And this is this is actually what the process is called normalization. So what we do is we add a new interaction like this with a with a little with a little cross here. What, what's that cross supposed to represent? Um, that cross is supposed to represent a whole bunch of short distance stuff that we don't know. It could be some new particles. It could be extra dimensions. We have no idea what's going on where this cross is sitting. But we do know that whatever is going on here, if we knew what it was, we would calculate it and we'd get a number. Well, we get a number that depends on some stuff, but we, you know, we get a number. So what we do is we add the second direction, we put a number here, and we just say we don't know what it is. It's something. If we knew what was going on inside this bubble, if we knew extra dimensions or new particles or whatever, then we could calculate the number from first principles. We don't, so it just becomes a parameter of our model. And uh, well, in general, in quantum electromagnetism, we have to introduce a couple of other new numbers. But the miracle of quantum electromagnetism, quantum electrodynamics, is that if you introduce those these new numbers, then you get an answer that's completely finite. So in this sum, I've had to, I've had to include extra diagrams, extra pieces that 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 involve transitioning to some short distance physics that I don't know. So there's something going on here. I don't know what it is, but it gives me some number. Okay, and now I get a finite answer. That finite answer depends on the, the parameters that I introduce to control the short distance physics, but okay, it's the best I can do. And the miracle of quantum electrodynamics is that once you introduce three numbers, you, introduce, you say, okay, there's some short distance physics happening here that I don't know, there's some short distance physics here that I don't know, and some short distance physics here that I don't know. And once I introduce these three numbers, every calculation you do in quantum electrodynamics becomes finite. And in fact, only two of these numbers are observable. I put the three here for, you know, yeah. yeah. Only two of them are observable. One of them is an overall normalization. It doesn't matter. And those numbers effectively are telling us the electronic charge in the mass. So once we measure two things, quantum electrodynamics becomes predictable. We can start cranking out predictions, and that's why it's such a great theory. So the way that I presented it, what are the electron charge and mass really doing? The electron charge and the electron mass are properties of the electron that in principle we should be able to compute from fundamental theory, if we knew physics at all energy scales, at all distance scales, but we don't know physics at all distance scales, we only know, you know, we don't know what's going on in very short distance scales. And the electron charge and the mass are the way, are the are parameters that describe how our theory depends on that unknown physics at short distance scales. So now I'm going to bring back, this is a slide from lecture five, I think, I just copied it. Um, the standard model has lots of infinities, just like these ones I just talked about just like the ones in electromagnetism. Um, and that means the standard model depends on lots of details of short distance physics. And in the standard model, another miracle happens. And that is that it only depends on short distance physics through 19 parameters. 19 is a lot more. It's more particles, all their interactions, and whatever. But 19 is more than three or, or two. But it's still a finite number, which means that you know the standard model isn't complete. It depends on some short distance physics we don't know. but. OK, that we only depend on that short distance physics through 19 numbers. We can make 19 measurements and start cranking out predictions. And that's how the standard model works. So now we can ask what happens if we try to apply these ideas to gravity. Well, in quantum gravity, and actually I probably should have just written with gravitons here, but I, I wrote it like In quantum gravity, the basic interaction is, is, is essentially this one. It's not an electron with a photon, but an electron with this quantum electromagnetism quantum of gravity, which I call the graviton, um, <coughs> draw it the same way as the photon, because it's the same idea. It's a force carrier particle. I gave it a slightly different label. It's got two indices here instead of one. That's some detail. Don't worry about it. Um, but the first, you know, we already see one really different thing about quantum gravity related to electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, the coupling constant, E, was a number. I said it was 1 over 137. I should call it alpha. It, I said it was 1 over 137. In gravity, it's not a number. It's a mass scale. You can see that from over here. The force has units of energy squared, or mass squared. These are, these are also mass squared. So in order for the dimensions to work out right, g has to have units of length squared. 
um, and lake squared is 1 over mass squared. And if you, if you write down what the Newton constant is in, in sort of um, uh, uh, natural units, the ones we set Planck's constant, the speed of light to 1, it's 10 to the 18 GeV. And to remind you, uh, proton, the mass of a proton is about 1 GeV. The energy scales that the LHC experiment, the giant collider in Switzerland are probing is about 10 to the 3 GeV. So this is a, a good 15 orders of magnitude higher than uh, any energy scale that our accelerators are probing. Yeah. But the fact that the interaction has dimensions, that it gives a characteristic energy scale, is a first sign of trouble, something different from electromagnetism. And it's a sign of trouble that we've seen before. Where did we see it before? We saw it before in the discussion of beta decay. And I'll put back this picture of Fermi with the wrong equation in the corner. Um, we saw it in the discussion of beta decay. Remember, we talked about the neutron decay to a proton. Um, Fermi suggested there was a local interaction that did it. And this local interaction also had a scale, the Fermi constant. And it had a scale at 300 GeV. And we said, this is a problem, because any time you compute something in this theory, it's going to be an expansion. This is just like the expansion in the electromagnetic charge, and this expansion in powers of E we had before uh, in electromagnetism. This could be an expansion in the dimensionless parameter, which in this case is the Fermi constant times the energy squared, where the energy here is the energy in which the experiment is being performed. And if I just plug in what Fermi's constant is, it means it's an expansion that goes like E over 300, that where every term is multiplied by E over 300 GeV squared. This is fine if the energy E, which we're doing our experiment, is lower than 300 GeV. But if the energy E, in which we're doing our experiment, is higher than 300 GeV, then this is a big number, this is a bigger number, and the series expansion just goes completely out of control. So the idea of talking about um, what's going on in terms of just this, this, this interaction, the diagrams from it, from it just makes no sense. So we concluded from this before that Fermi's theory was good for energy smaller than 300 GeV, but it was incomplete uh, and couldn't describe physics above 300 GeV. And, well, we saw, indeed, a new physics did emerge around 300 GeV. Well, it emerged at 80 GeV, but that's roughly the same. They differ by a factor of order four. As you approach 300 GeV, you realize that Fermi's theory is incomplete. It's not really like this. But this interaction is just, a, it's just a, an approximation to the real thing that's going on, which is this. We saw that as you go to higher and higher energies near 300 GeV, you can see there was a particle that, that was flying around in the middle here. At low energies, you can't see this particle. So the, this interaction looks like this one. You'll notice that if I pull this line out, they look the same. But as you go to high energies, you can resolve this new particle. It's a massive particle at 80 GeV. And this particle was one of the carriers of the electroweak interaction. And this led to the electroweak theory, which didn't have the problems with so Fermi's theory is an effective theory, and that it can only describe physics below 300 GeV. As you go above 300 GeV, you need something new. And this was, this, in this case, something new was pretty simple. So anytime your, inter your fundamental interaction has a characteristic scale, it's telling you that that description is a good, is a decent description below that scale, but as you get up to that scale, something new happens. It tells you there's new physics waiting for you at this scale. Gravity is similar to this. Okay? So if I think about the coupling of an electron with a graviton, I get a big series expansion like this, and I get the first term is going to go like e over m plus squared, the second like e over m plus to the fourth, and so on and so forth. This m plus is a much bigger number, 10 to the 18 GeV is much bigger than 300 GeV. But still, it tells us that this idea of describing the quantum gravity with graviton exchange is a fine thing if you're worried about energy smaller than the Planck scale. But if you want to go to energies beyond the Planck scale, you're, you know, you're completely screwed. There's nothing you can do because this whole, this whole formalism breaks down. And oh, by the way, these coefficients, when you evaluate them, they're infinite, just like we had in quantum, just like we had in quantum electrodynamics. So there's two problems. And by the way, I, I presented them separately, but they're actually very, very much related. They're not, they're not that unrelated. Um, the expansion of graviton exchange breaks down when your energy is close to the Planck scale, which means that this theory of graviton exchange, unlike quantum electromagnetism, is an effective theory at best. There's new physics waiting for us at this scale. We don't know what it is, and this isn't going to teach us anything about what it is. And the second problem is that we've already run into infinities again, um, which reflects the fact that we're sensitive to some unknown short distance physics. Now, we can try to parametrize our ignorance just like we did with quantum electromagnetism. Um, so we can proceed to do that. If we calculate what happens if you just have a graviton moving through space, this correction is actually infinite. Seems weird, but if you sum over everything that can go on in here, you get an infinity. So we must be missing some physics. 
There's some short distance physics that we don't know. So we introduce a new interaction to describe that physics. And remember, you can just think of this cross as representing um, you know, large extra dimensions, extra dimensions, new particles, you know, all sorts of stuff that we don't know. We don't know what all that stuff is, but we know if we did know what it was, it would just give us a number. And so we just write an x here and, and put a number down for whatever the result of that calculation would be. OK, we move on. Um, this is still infinite. Even after I've introduced this interaction that's not enough, this is still infinite. This depends on the short distance physics in a different way. So we're missing some physics, and so we introduce another new interaction. OK, fine. Um, then we do another calculation. OK, this is still infinite. So we're missing some physics. OK, so we introduce another new interaction. OK. And uh, the, the problem with quantum gravity is this process literally never ends. You keep going and keep going and keep going. I could have gone off the page. And <clears throat> keep going. You need, have to keep adding new and new, new interactions. The punchline is, the, you, unlike quantum electrodynamics, we had this miracle where we didn't know what the short distance physics was, but we were only sensitive to two numbers about it. And once we measured those two numbers, then everything else was fine. In quantum gravity, that is not the case. You need to introduce infinitely many new parameters in order to cure the infinities of quantum gravity. And the physical, the physical meaning of that is the following. Unlike the standard model, gravity is extremely sensitive to the details of short distance physics. So before we can make any sharp prediction in quantum gravity, we have to fix all these numbers, which means we have to measure infinitely many things. It's impossible. So really, you have a theory of nothing. Now, I can write down the, an the exact answer for any amplitude in quantum gravity. In principle, you have to compute all the amplitudes. But that answer is going to depend on infinitely not many numbers that I don't know. So it's really a worthless answer, worth nothing. So I, I mention this because people often, people often harp on string theory. And one of the criticisms of string theory is that it's not, it has trouble with predictions. But the problem of predictivity is a fundamental problem of quantum gravity in general. It is one of the problems. So, this is a realization of the statement I made at the beginning. We cannot cleanly separate long distance physics from short distance physics like we did with the standard model. And that's the problem with graviton exchange. And I put a summary slide just to really beat it, you know, beat this idea to death. So, with the standard model, we don't know all sorts of short distance physics, but we don't care very much. We're only sensitive to it through 19 numbers, so we make 19 measurements and we get a predictive framework. With quantum gravity, we don't know the ultra short distance physics, and it is a big problem because we're sensitive to that physics through infinitely many numbers. In other words, we're sensitive to every detail of the short distance physics. And I'll try to give a heuristic argument later for why that is. Uh, that's coming later. Um, which means we need to make infinitely many measurements before any sharp predictions can be made. Now, I have to say, yeah, so, so this leads to the statement that quantum gravity is not predictive. And I put an asterisk here because just because you can't make completely sharp predictions doesn't mean that graviton exchange is useless. And I, I, you know, it's not completely useless, and I want to um, have a slide on that. So this is a one first of two slightly more technical slides, I guess. The situation is not that bad. Um, and it's because if I look at this expansion, each one of these guys was infinity before. So it's going to depend on some of the new parameters we introduced to control the short distance physics. If we were interested in keeping all the terms here, summing over all the diagrams, then we would need all infinitely many parameters. However, each individual term only depends on a finite number of parameters. So for example, if we're doing an experiment at some energy that's much lower than the Planck scale, like at the LHC, for example, where E over M Planck is 10 to the minus 15, this is a small number, 10 to the minus 30. This is a much smaller number, 10 to the minus 60. You probably are never going to even measure this. Well, let's say we can measure this. You're never going to measure this or this. So you don't care about any of these things. And since you don't care about any of these things, if you only care about the first two terms, then you don't need the whole infinite number of parameters. You only need a finite number of them. So if you're only worried about an experiment with you know, measurements at some limit in precision, then you don't need all infinitely many parameters. You only need a finite number, and so you can recover a predictive framework. But as you go to energies higher, closer to M Planck, you need more and more terms. And as you need more and more terms, you need to measure more and more of these parameters. So as the energy that you're doing your experiment approaches the Planck scale, you become more and more sensitive to the short distance physics above the Planck scale. And when you get to the Planck scale, your whole theory breaks, so you know nothing about what that short distance physics is above the Planck scale. You're just completely, there's nothing you can do. So I think that's what I said in this slide. 
And energy is small compared to n plug. We only need finitely many numbers to compute to a given level of precision. By the way, this is how we know that this is really not a totally crazy way to describe gravity, because you can check, you can check that Einstein's gravity emerges in a classical limit. Um, the closer we get to m plot, the more terms we need. And at m plot and beyond, we have no clue what's going on. And graviton exchange is not going to give us any clues. So problems. Quantum gravity is incomplete. It's an effective theory at best. It breaks down at the plot scale. Um, it's extremely sensitive to unknown short distance physics, and it, can never it can't tell us anything about what that short distance physics is. Um, and it's impossible to make sharp predictions. You can predict to a given level of precision, but it requires a number of measurements that grow as we go to higher energy. And that means that we have a fancy theory of gravitons, but this, the fancy theory of gravitons can't tell us anything about the things we really want to study quantum gravity to learn. And that's the physics of black holes and physics of the early universe and the Big Bang. Both of these depend, basically, the theory of graviton exchange works when quantum corrections are very, very small. As soon as any of the details of quantum gravity start becoming important, the graviton exchange completely breaks. It just breaks. So, now I'm, I'm, I'm being repetitive again. Physics at short and long distances are intertwined. We can't build up our understanding of quantum gravity by gradually moving up in energy scales. Now, I'd like to give you a heuristic picture for uh, why this happens. You know, I, the way I like to think about it is like this. Um, why is gravity so sensitive to the physics at short distances? Well, you can imagine there's a bunch of stuff going on at short distances. If we zoomed in, there could be extra particles, extra dimensions, and so on. Now, in all likelihood, most of this stuff isn't going to talk to the standard model. These particles aren't going to carry standard model charge. Definitely, the, the degrees of freedom that control the shape of the extra dimension are not going to have standard model charge. So the standard model, for the most part, doesn't care about many of the details of this, because the standard model is not going to couple to most of this. Gravity is different from the standard model, though, because gravity couples to everything. No matter what's in here, gravity is going to interact with it. Gravity is going to interact with every new particle, every new degree of freedom controlling the shape of an extra dimension. It's going to depend on everything. So this is really why gravity is so sensitive to what's going on at short distances. The standard model may or may not interact with what's going on at short distances, but gravity couples to everything. So it will depend on every last detail of the physics that's going on in here. Everything. And, and, and it does so in a small way. So um, now I have two slides about how you can try to make progress, um, try to learn things from gravitonics. You know, you have this infinite number of parameters. Can you learn anything about physics at high energies by, by looking at the, the structure of these parameters? And I mention this because people have tried to do that. You have an infinite number of parameters, but not all of the infinite number, not all, not all the choices of these parameter values lead to consistent physics. There's two things that we require of any model of particle physics. One is causality, which is the information shouldn't travel faster than light. And the other is this thing, unitarity, I mentioned a few lectures ago about probabilities that the net sum of all probabilities should be 100%. If I set up an experiment, the probability that something happens should be 100%. And it turns out if you make random choices for these infinitely many parameters, you violate these a lot. So you can try to get some control over what these parameters should be um, by studying um, these issues. People have made a little bit of progress in this direction. A few constraints have been derived. There's a pretty famous paper that came out, actually it came out while I was a grad student, some people uh, uh, that I knew about saying that gravity had to, had to be the weakest force of nature, just based on these general considerations. Um, they're probably part of a more general story, but you know, you're trying to get a handle on an infinite number of terms using some <coughs> complicated principles, so it's hard to make progress. Okay. So that's the end of what I want to say about graviton exchange. And the punchline there is really that, again, unlike the standard model, Gravity depends, because gravity couples to everything, it depends on every detail of what's going on at short distances. So it's not enough to just know a little bit, and it's not enough that we can parametrize our ignorance and make a few measurements and fix things like that. We really have to know what the physics is at all distant scales in order to have control, have control over quantum gravity. So that's the punchline. And that brings me to the second part of the talk, which is largely disconnected from the first. 
um, which is another arena in which you can see the um, intertwining of long and short distance physics and gravity. This is uh, another way that you can see that gravity behaves sort of not in ways that we expect, and that's the so-called black hole information paradox. So, to remind you what a black hole is, we talked about black holes a little bit last time. Um, black holes curve light, curve space so strongly that not even light can escape. And I drew a, a picture of the black hole here, and I drew the Penrose diagram here. And the thing to remember about a Penrose diagram is only two things you need to remember. One, time point on, and light moves on diagonal lines. So, everything that moves slower than light moves pretty close to vertically, and everything that moves faster than light moves sort of horizontally. And you can see any beam of light that originates inside this little triangle region, well, it, it has to move diagonally, so it's forced to hit the singularity up here. So there's no way that light can get out and not hit the singularity. So this is the event horizon of the black hole. It's the region beyond which uh, not, not even light can escape. So light can't escape a black hole, but oddly enough, uh, black holes can radiate energy. So you, know, you might think a black hole is something that just sucks things in, but black holes actually radiate energy. And how does that happen? Well, you can imagine that the, the, the gravitational field around a black hole has some energy. And any time you have, you have that, you have a vacuum here, particle and antiparticle pairs can pop out of existence. You know, things are always happening in the vacuum, vacuum is always a crazy place. Now, usually when this happens, this particle will come back around and annihilate the antiparticle. But what can happen sometimes is that uh, one of the particles will fall into the horizon of the black hole, where it's doomed to hit the singularity and be gone forever, while the other particle keeps moving out. So the net result of this process is, before I just had a black hole sitting here, and now I have a black hole with a particle moving away with some energy. So this particle is carrying energy away from the black hole. Uh, and that energy is, uh, well, there's a name for that, it's called Hawking radiation. So this led to a revolution in the 60s and 70s where people realized that black holes are really thermal objects. They carry an intrinsic temperature, they carry an entropy, they describe a huge number of uh, microstates, and the, the entropy, these things are determined by the area of the event horizon, or the region beyond which nothing can escape. Um, and the names behind that, of course, are Beckenstein and Hawking. And I think Beckenstein was responsible for really discussing the entropy, and, and that came out because there are laws of black hole dynamics that look just like the laws of thermodynamics if you identify the area with the entropy. And, and Stephen Hawking, of course, did his famous work on, on radiation. So now if we wait long enough, these black holes not only radiate energy, but if we wait long enough, the black hole will completely evaporate. And this is, this is what leads to the problem of information loss. And people used to describe this in terms of the Encyclopedia Britannica, but I don't think they make print versions of that anymore. I thought I read somewhere that they don't make print versions of this topic in print versions. So I'll imagine putting, uh, having a big data tower or computer data storage system or something. You have the entire contents of Wikipedia on it. <coughs> By the way, Wikipedia is fantastic for math and physics. I don't know about for other stuff. I think it maybe gets politically charged. I don't know, but for math and physics, it's great. Um, so. It's because there's, there's no politics in math and physics, so, right? So, ha, 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 if only that were true. <laughs> Listen to the nonsense I'm telling you. <laughs> so, suppose we throw a collection of hard drives with a copy of Wikipedia into the black hole. So, and then the black hole evaporates. Well, I had a bunch of information stored in here. It went into the black hole. It disappeared, and when the black hole evaporated, it's gone. So, where did all that information go? The information can't be destroyed like this in quantum mechanics, so uh, this is an inconsistency with quantum mechanics. And this is sort of the cartoon version of the information paradox. <coughs> if you are not happy with this description of the information paradox, then that's great. Because this is very you know, hand maybe. You know, the, the paradox is a bit sharper. And I'm going to try to say something about what it really is. So <coughs> when radiation, when these electron-positron pairs created, they're created at the same time. And they're created in an entangled state. Um, which is to say that the state of one electron, the quantum state of one electron, is not completely independent of the other one. We can't describe it by its own state independent of the other one. You can think about it like, imagine that the pair production process was such that their spins were correlated, so that one, one they always had opposite spin. So that if this is spin up, then this is spin down, and this is spin up, down, and this is spin up. So their, their states are entangled. Um, so that means that when this particle comes out, we cannot describe this radiation 
with its own independent wave function. We can't describe it with its own independent quantum state. The state of this particle is entangled with the state of this one. And since this one fell into the black hole, the state of this particle is actually entangled with the quantum state of the black hole. So, yeah. Now, a state that is entangled with something else carries less information, in a sense, than a pure state. Because the state of this thing depends on what state the black hole is in. So, there, you know, if we know what state the black hole is in, then we can construct all the information about everything in the system. But if we don't know what state the black hole is in, then we don't know everything there is to know about the ongoing radiation. So, the radiation is entangled with the black hole, and, well, it carries less information because we don't know the precise quantum state of the black hole. And the real source of the information paradox, where it's really coming from, is the statement that we cannot know the precise state of the black hole. So, yeah. So, this comes from some discussions of classical gravity. So, in classical gravity, the geometry outside the horizon of the black hole is actually unique. Um, you can look for uh, solutions that are small perturbations of the black hole that look like a black hole except they differ a little bit. And there are these things called no-hair theorems. And if you want to know anything about, about that, probably Bob Wall, the world expert in, in black hole solutions and general relativity and all that, is here, you know, over in the, our new space where the Eureka Fermi Institute is now. Um, great book on general relativity. Um, so in classical gravity, these uh, black hole or geometry of horizon is unique. Black holes have no hair. And you know, the, the hair would be some small feature that would allow you to distinguish one from another. So if you're sitting outside the horizon, classical gravity tells you that every black hole looks the same. There's, no, if, there, there's nothing that you could detect that would tell you that it, you know, they could distinguish one quantum state from a black hole or another. When you're outside the horizon, every black hole looks the same, regardless of what its in interior quantum state is. Now, you might think that you can tell something about the quantum state of the black hole if you include quantum effects. But the curvature, and I'm going to tell you the story about, you know, the general story that you, that, that you learn in graduate, graduate school about, about black holes. The curvature near the horizon is very, very small. You know, the black hole solution is singular in the middle. It, the curvatures are strong here. It's very strongly curved. The gravitational field is very strong here. Out at the horizon, the curvature is very small. You're almost in flat space. And the thing that they tell you as a graduate student when you study quantum, when you study black holes, is that if you're an observer and you pass across the event horizon of a black hole, you have no idea what you're in for. Because you cannot tell. There's no measurement you could do in a local coordinate dash near, say, your rocket ship. Uh, they can tell you that you just passed the horizon of a black hole. Space-time looks very flat, everything looks very ordinary, the gravitational field is weak, the gravitational force is small. So everything looks ordinary, so there's no reason to expect that quantum mechanics has any role to play at all. So that means that if all the quantum stuff is happening here, where the singularity is, and where we are trying to learn about the state of the black hole is outside, because once we go in, we're not getting back out, there's no way that we can learn about the information of the quantum state, which is sitting here, by making a measurement out here. So this is why we cannot you know, there's no way that we can say what the quantum state of the black hole is. Yeah, and this is just a statement quantum corrections are too small to help because the curvature is small. So our Wikipedia starts in a pure state, we throw it in. Um, the radiation that comes out is entangled with the black hole, and we have no idea what state the black hole is in. So the radiation that comes out carries less information in that sense uh, than, than what we threw in. And it's impossible to reconstruct the state of the Wikipedia because we never know the exact state of the black hole. And in fact, it's even worse than this. You can imagine I throw in Wikipedia, radiation comes out, the radiation is entangled with the black hole. The black hole radiates away. When the black hole is completely radiated away, radiation is still entangled, but what's it entangled with? There's nothing left for it to be entangled with. So this whole picture is completely inconsistent with quantum mechanics because you've evolved from a pure state which is a state that you can describe in and of itself, to an entangled state, something that you can't describe unless you know what's going on behind the horizon of the black hole. So there was a famous bet about this. Um, uh, Stephen Hawking used to, and I think he still does, although I'm not sure he's been ill. Um, Stephen Hawking used to visit Caltech for about a month every spring. So he would come and talk to these guys who were at Caltech, 
And they had some, some bet about this that's got sort of a lot of attention to the news. So this is Dick Thorne, who's being a LIGO experiment. This is uh, John Prestel, um, I, whose office was on the same floor as mine, although I never really talked to him very much. Um, so these guys insisted information is really lost. The picture I just described is what is happening. Information is lost. Gravity is right. And quantum mechanics is wrong. Quantum mechanics says information can't be lost. It says that you, know, you lose problems with probabilities. They said quantum mechanics is wrong. Gravity is right. Um, uh, John Preskill said, no, 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 no. Quantum mechanics is right. Something with the picture you just described is wrong. Gravity is wrong. And it will not surprise you to learn that the guys who think gravity is right work on gravity for a living. And the guy who thinks that quantum mechanics is right works on quantum mechanics for a living. <laughs> no surprise. And very famously, Stephen Hawking conceded this bet in 2004. And what they bet was an encyclopedia of the other person's choosing. And John Preskill apparently liked baseball. So Stephen Hawking sent him the total baseball encyclopedia or something. Um, you notice I didn't put Kip Thorne on here. Kip Thorne has not conceded yet. So maybe it's not over. But Stephen Hawking conceded in 2004 and announced that he had understood why information loss and what's wrong with the information loss argument. Um, so the general accepted view is that information is not lost. So in order to see this completely, you need a fundamental understanding of quantum gravity and what the quantum, what, what the quantum states of the black hole are. Now, Hawking conceded his bet. He was convinced by arguments from string theory, which I'm not going to describe. But they're related to this ADS-CFT conjecture. What ADS-CFT does is it relates the theory of quantum gravity to another theory that has no gravity. And the other theory that has no gravity, we know and understand information is not lost. So that means that the theory that has gravity can't have information lost either. Um, now, when Hawking's original paper about the concession came out, his talk came out in 2004, 2005, uh, I was a grad student. We had a lot of discussion about it. Um, I think I don't. I, I think that we didn't think it was entirely right or convincing. And I think that the general status of this, according to the people I know who think about black hole information more deeply than I do, on the next slide, um, is that Hawking's argument is uh, he, he came to the right right conclusion for the wrong reasons. But. But there is a picture of black holes that string theory suggests that indicates where the gravity argument I gave you about information loss before goes wrong. So as usual, if you get a nonsense answer, it means that you've made a bad assumption. And I want to revisit an assumption that we made. We assumed, and I spent a lot of time talking about it, that there was no way to tell the internal quantum state of the black hole. That was the problem. And that happened because we assumed that if we're sitting just outside the horizon, we can't access the quantum information of the black hole because it's all sitting here. We assume that because the curvature is small here, because gravitational force is weak here, we assume that classical gravity is perfectly fine and that we could neglect any quantum corrections to gravity. That led to the state with the different quantum states all look the same at the horizon size. And it's a natural thing because space-time is almost flat near the horizon. So why on Earth should classical gravity break down? And, well, this was addressed by, by this guy. And everybody knows this guy, right? Do, does anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> anybody? You probably know. <laughs> Nobody knows who this guy is. It's, 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 it's too bad, because I, this guy, his, his name is Samir Mazur. And I, I just I wanted to say something about Samir. Um, Samir probably thinks about black holes in a deeper way than anybody I know. This is my own opinion. Um, and to give you a sense of where that opinion is coming from, Samir is a professor at Ohio State down the road in Columbus. And you can imagine the pain as a Michigan man that I felt in my heart <laughs> when I realized that this important problem of black hole information loss was probably solved in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> but it's a great solution. And I really love, I, I really love it. That's why I'm going to tell you about it. His proposal is that the black hole is a fuzzball. <laughs> I didn't name it. He did. He was a lot of um, And the, the statement is that different quantum states do not look the same at the horizon size. And he says the previous argument, in a simple way, the previous argument breaks down because the size of quantum effects is not parametrized by the curvature. But the importance of quantum mechanics is determined by the curvature times the number n, where n is the number of possible quantum states of the black hole. And we'll see in a minute why this n is important. n is the number of possible. So a black hole has a huge amount of energy. So because it has a huge amount of energy, there's a huge number of quantum states associated with it. So even if this curvature is small, n is an enormous number. And so this is not small. Now, let me say, 
Yeah. And so he replaces the picture of a black hole like this with something that looks like this. This is his cartoon of a fuzz ball. So, so uh, yeah, the idea of a fuzz ball is that the different quantum states of the black hole are already different from each other out here. So when you're at the horizon, you can tell some information about the quantum state of the black hole because the quantum fuzz is not sitting all here at the singularity. It's actually spread out over the entire horizon. And quantum gravity becomes, and this is essentially telling us that quantum gravity is becoming important at much longer distance scales than expected. This is a sort of part of the non-local behavior of quantum gravity in the sense that uh, the quantum states have a finite size, and it's different from anything we see in the other forces of nature. Now, I want to say, take a minute to talk about why that happened. Um, that happened because we cannot pack large numbers of quantum states into a small box. Quantum states have an intrinsic size in quantum gravity. So I said this conjecture ultimately came out from string theory. And the reason is, is that in string theory, there's a large class, and I'm not saying not to need any details of string theory, there's a large class of black hole solutions, that black holes that you can study in string theory. And you can actually understand in some sense, the microscopic states, of the different, different microscopic states of the black hole. And you can look at those states and see you know, what they are and the distance scales over which they vary. And most of them, you know, a few, a few are, are pretty flat out here and, and all the quantum fuzzes in here, but most of them are very quantum and weird all the way out to the horizon side. So as you're moving along as an observer, as you pass the horizon, you detect quantum fuzziness almost right away as soon as you get here. The, 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 so the, 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 yeah. so, so the, the, the volume, the size of, the, of different quantum states, um, or, or sorry, um, the, this, you can only put a finite number of quantum states into a small uh, uh, volume of space. So in order to fit all the quantum states that are accessible to something with energy E, most of those quantum states have a very large size, and that size comes out at the end of the horizon. Now this leads me to another aspect of the conjecture, and that is that um, the black hole solution itself, the singular geometry with the horizon and nothing can escape and all this, is it really uh, an honest state of gravity? Or is it really something, is something that we should reject because of the singularity? Where the black hole so geometry comes from is kind of like a coarse grained average over all these more complicated quantum states, some of which you can describe as smooth geometry, some of which you can't. You see, if you wanted to do some calculation from out here, scattering up the black hole or something, if you don't know the quantum state of the black hole, you'd have to average over all the geometry. And the statement is that this thing, the picture of a simple singularity and event horizon, is really the result of a thermal average of all of these more complicated things. And if you've ever worked with these, this averaging kind of procedure before, you know you can take a lot of smooth things, a lot of smooth functions, for example, and compute some kind of thermal average, and the thermal average will have some will have some singular behavior. And that's what the singularity is, and that's what the horizon is. Um, none of these individual states have anything like an event horizon. You can understand Hawking radiation in this language because you can have something, you know, you can, you can measure, if you shoot a particle at here, this quantum fuzz, you can measure, or you can compute how long it takes to bounce around between the different quantum states before it comes back out. And so you have a picture of Hawking radiation, but that picture of Hawking radiation is a little bit different. I also mentioned something else. This is a picture I borrowed from a, a slide that Jan Burg, or talked to Jan de Bourg gave in Strings 2010 in, in uh, College Station. Um, this I thought was really interesting. Uh, there are other examples in string theory of geometries like this. Uh, this is an example of a, pi a picture of a warped throat. So you just think of a, a tube, and you can make this tube go as, as deep as you want. Um, these are geometries that are weakly curved everywhere. But you can actually, through a, through a calculation, you can compute how many quantum states can fit inside there. Actually, one of my earliest papers as a grad student was, was one of the papers on doing this kind of computation of uh, uh, quantizing geometries and counting states. Um, and you, can, you find that even though you can have essentially a throat region of an infinite area or infinite volume, because of the weird way that it's warped, you can only fit one or sometimes zero quantum states in that region. They always have some leakage out. So it's a very weird property of quantum gravity that we don't see in the other forces of nature. So, Quantum gravity exhibits many features that we don't see in those other forces of nature. It leads to a breakdown of naturalness. Quantum effects are important even when curvatures are small. That's what ultimately solved the information problem. And a breakdown of locality. Quantum states can be spread over large distances. If you have 
huge, huge numbers of states, you start running into the problem that you run out of room to describe it. For people who like thinking in terms of phase space, there is a correlation between volumes in phase space and volumes in real space. So, <sighs> we can try to learn about uh, what, so we've seen all this, this bit about how short distance physics is correlated with long distance physics. We can try to make some progress, but our description of gravitons cannot help to understand any of the stuff about black holes, as we said before, because it doesn't know anything about physics at short distances. As we go to higher and higher energies, we need more and more terms. As soon as we get to m Planck, we need infinitely many terms, and the expansion makes no sense. So we're infinitely sensitive to, to, to physics above the Planck scale. We have no way of describing physics above the Planck scale. So we can't proceed like the standard model by, you know, understanding physics up to some energy scale and then moving up a little bit and moving up a little bit. We can't do that. Everything completely breaks when you get to the Planck scale, which means we need to start with some description that makes sense at all energies. And, well, that's what string theory is about. And that's an advertisement for the next lecture, which will be about string theory, which I hope you can, you can, you can, you can join us for uh, navigating through the horrible data traffic. So here's my summary, and I left myself a couple of minutes in order to describe it in detail. Quantum gravity is hard because quantum effects can be very important even at long distance scales. We cannot separate out physics at short distances from physics at long distances. We talked about the model of graviton exchange in the first part of the talk, which treats quantum gravity by analogy to the other force of the standard model. This has similarities to Fermi's theory in that, it's in, in that it's incomplete. It's an effective description that breaks down the Planck scale, and it's very sensitive to physics beyond the Planck scale. And we saw this infinitely many parameters to completely specify the theory. In the second part, we talked about the black hole information paradox. Black holes radiate energy and completely evaporate. The radiation is entangled with the quantum state of the black hole, and gravity tells us we can't know anything about the state of the black hole, which leads to information loss. But information is not really lost. Quantum fuzziness of the black hole is not confined to the singularity. It's not confined to where curvatures are large. It's not confined to where the forces are large. The quantum fuzz of the black hole extends all the way out to the horizon, where curvatures are small and forces are weak. Quantum gravity breaks down a longer distance scale than we ever would have expected, and that's what really resolves the information problem. So the problem of quantum gravity, in a nutshell, because of this, this fact that long distance and short distance physics is so strongly correlated, is that we cannot build a description by moving up. We can't proceed by <coughs> understanding low energy physics and going a little higher and a little higher. High energy physics and low energy physics is very closely correlated, and the only way to see is with some inspiration. And well, that's what string theory is all about. And we'll talk about string theory next time. So I'll stop there.